Okay. I have a degree of embarrassment about this, which, because we're friends, I'll share with you. In that, what I, when I signed up to do these lectures, which I'm delighted to do and learn a lot from doing, I thought there'd be you know, a small, intimate group of five or eight people who knew would know nothing about me and hadn't had any idea what they were signing up for, and I was going to talk to them. And one of the topics I was going to talk to them about was Malievich. However, I did give a public lecture here last term on Malievich, and what I'm going to do today is not radically dissimilar uh, from what I did before. So, if you want to stay, you may have heard this before, but you know, the second time is always fun. Uh, so, anyway, I want to try and situate what I'm doing in relation to uh, the general question of the line. I mean, what will emerge this week is, if you like, the centrality of the concept of abstraction. And abstraction is one of those terms I've, I've mentioned and have alluded to, but have not discussed in great detail. But as I said, some of you will have heard this before, but that's all right. And, um, but abstraction can be understood, it can be misunderstood, if we understand abstraction as taking something from something. So you abstract something, and, and which means that the thing from which you abstract it is pre-existent and therefore has the quality of a pre-existent entity, you abstract something from it. When abstraction is used in Europe in the 20s, it has a different quality. It is a generative term. Abstraction, as I'll try and argue with, in relation to Malievich, is linked to a notion of potentiality. Now, potentiality is again a topic that we, you know, I've, I've alluded to, but I just want to spend, along with abstraction, some time clarifying. Abstraction is not something you take from something. An abstract line is a line that has potentiality. It's a line that will become something. But it's a line that will become something. And once you can argue that it's a line that will become something, because it has potential, it therefore can't be understood as a representation. It doesn't stand for anything other than itself. And if you remember what I was trying to argue in relation to Walter Benjamin, it seemed like years ago, but it was only last week, was that what became interesting when his conception of, the, of, of composition or the, that notion of drawing was that these, these were lines that, as it were, stood for themselves. They didn't stand for anything or represent anything. They, they stood for themselves. And as such, they either demarcate a field, which would be in the case of painting what we call composition, which has the right to be named, they demarcate a field, or when we move to architecture, something else is at stake. And indeed, it's worth recognizing that the line, you remember last week I talked about Rembrandt's painting. I talked about uh, the, 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 the Feast of Belshazzar, that painting which is down in the National Gallery, so you should go and look at it where all of a sudden you see the words written uh, on the painting and those words stand for nothing other than what they are. They enact something. Now on the level of painting, that will do. What's enacted is just that. And that is not the limit of painting in the sense that it's painting's weakness. What it does is plot the specificity of painting. So the image within painting operates that way. Now we're not interested at the moment in the image in painting, we're interested in the image within architecture. What makes Malievich so interesting is that he moves between painting and architecture. And therefore our discussion will enable us to, to identify the two. So potentiality within architecture necessitates a conception of ab the abstract line as that which will allow something. Now what it will allow becomes the question. Equally, the allowing necessitates the overcoming of its being abstract and therefore the realizing of its potentiality. Now, that to my mind is precisely what uh, Malievich was concerned to do. Malievich was concerned, I'll say a bit about Malievich in a moment. Malievich was concerned with a different conception of the politics of art or the politics of drawing than one that lay in content, 
And this, to my, my mind, is a very interesting distinction. In the early part of the, the 20th century in Russia, the 1917 revolution being the point that marks the modern period in Russia. Prior to that and afterwards, there were a group of artists uh, and architects, you, you know of, but I'll tell you anyway, who we now call the constructivists. Two of them are uh, Malievich and Lizitsky. Now, Lizit, they both worked together around a notion of abstraction, and as I'll point out in a little while, they both worked around the notion of the zero. What's interesting in the distinction in their careers is at a certain moment both Malievich and Lizitsky recognized that the political lay in the autonomous line, a line that was to find form. In other words, the politics of art had nothing to do with content. And at a certain moment, Mal not Malievich but Lizitsky abandons that as a project and sees that the, politic, the politics of art resides in the slogan, and therefore it resides in content, no longer in abstraction. So what Malievich does is maintain the abstract line. But to maintain the abstract line maintains, if you like, something that is uh, autonomous, but equally something that has to be understood as having potentiality. Now, the reason why I raise both the terms abstraction and potentiality is that during the course of this week, I want to look at next tomorrow and Wednesday and Thursday, uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, sorry, is I want to develop the idea of the diagram. So I want to look at, in part at some of Deleuze's writings, but also uh, just the general question of the diagram in general. But I want to situate, the, 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 as it were, the prehistory of the diagram in Malievich's notion of the abstract line. So if we situate him in this way, I'm moving away from a direct concern with constructivism. I recognize the importance of constructivism, but I want to reposition Malievich in some sense away from that. The, the lecture series is called From Splines to Lines. So I'm rewriting gesturally the history of the line given what's happened to it. So I want to see now Malievich's interest in abstraction and on potentiality as part of the prehistory that becomes possible because of what's happened to the development of the line. And I also want to link this, as I did in the first term, to the work we looked at last week on Benjamin. So moving away from constructivism is to move away from it as just a mere historical moment. Repositioning the work involves giving it a location after the advent of the digital image. I mean, the project is how do you interpret Malievich given the digital image? In other words, accepting the implicit direction opened by Walter Benjamin that artworks demand reinterpretation within the conceptual framework presented by the actual presence of technical innovation. That reinterpretation is the afterlife of the work. In other words, what I want to, I, I want to take Benjamin is arguing the following, as I mentioned in the very first lecture, at the beginning of last week. I want to take him as arguing this, that given a shift, a fundamental shift in the nature of technical reproduction, given that, what that then generates are concepts and categories that emerge as a demand from that innovation. Therefore, we have to think what's specific to film. Now, the temptation is to abandon earlier art forms, such as painting, because they're no longer part of what's going on. This would be to misunderstand the force of Benjamin's argument. Part of it is to say we now reinterpret the history of the image within the concepts and categories that the, new, that the innovation gives us. In other words, we give to artwork an afterlife, and that afterlife is what is released by the transformations caused by conceptual shifts brought about by changes in the nature of technical reproduction. So that's the basis, if you like, of the argument. So given what's happened to the history of the line, what happens when we re-look at, look at Malievich again? What happens when we look at Malievich again is that what we come to think of are abstraction and potentiality as being the two determining uh, moments of them. And these cause us to think about how we understand the images that are presented to us.
Now, in order to make this point clearer, I want to draw a distinction between what I want to call an illustrative image and a generative image. An illustrative image is the one where I show you, give you a talk, and I say, oh, here's an example of what I'm talking about. It's an illustrative image. It illustrates the argument I'm giving you. It becomes something that buttresses it, that supports it. I want to make a distinction between an illustrative image and a generative image. And I want to say that these actually can be the same images. So the art historian writing about Russian art in the 20s will show you a picture of a Malievich drawing, and that will illustrate what he or she is doing. Now, for in, within an architecture school, there's no point seeing this image as illustrative. We have to see it as generative. Namely, if it's going to work for us architecturally, outside of the very worthy occupation of architectural history, which is perfectly acceptable, nothing wrong with it, some of my best friends, etc. But outside the realm of architectural history, if we want to see it as a generative image, it's the same image, but we have to look at it fundamentally differently. Hence, what I said to you in the very beginning, the question you must always ask is, what are you asking me to look at? When I show you the Malievich images, I'm not going to ask you to look at them as illustrative. I'm going to say to you what they pose for us are real problems on the nature of the generative image. Now, and I want to, like, all distinctions are fragile. Fragility is the way things are. I, I know that this is a distinction, therefore it, it, it has a fragility. I don't care. There is a distinction between these two senses of image, and I think it's important to maintain it. So therefore, and I would also want to argue that Malievich knew this. The illustrative image only ever refers to that which it illustrates. Its definition is given by that location. The generative image, and it may be the same image as I keep saying, however, is abstract. Abstraction is not that which exists without figure, however. Such a formulation merely reduces abstraction to being no more than the negation of figure. The contrary is the case. Abstraction is what is linked with what has potentiality in relation to possible figuration. Figuration is linked within abstraction for us to form creation. Abstraction will always involve a possible opening to figure, and because it involves a possible opening to figure, abstraction by definition has to be defined in relation to potentiality. In regards to that definition, the distinction between architectural drawing and abstraction in painting needs to be located. The abstraction in painting, we don't need to think of as generative. We don't need to think of what in terms of having potentiality. We do want to think of the architectural image in these ways. An addition needs to be made. It is not just that abstraction involves potentiality. Potentiality understood as abstraction will always maintain a discontinuous relation to figure. Let me try and make this clearer. We conventionally and in a very limited, somewhat silly way, think in terms of logics of negation. It's abstract, why? Because there aren't any figures. It's figurative, why? Well, it's not abstract, otherwise you know, there are figures. In other words, we see one thing as the negation of the other. But if we think outside that logic of negation, which gives us no internal specificity, just a, it can't be this, that, or it has to be that, once we think beyond that structure, and we think about abstraction in terms of potentiality, then what is interesting is this potentiality is not simply with no direction. The potentiality is always linked to the finding of figure. So figure is an after effect of the possibility of an abstract line thought of as having potentiality. It's the after effect. It comes to figure. And what figures is the figure. Now, therefore, the interesting question is how do we release the potentiality of the abstract line? How do we allow the abstract line to find figure? And it's interesting if you read Kandinsky, if you think about Clay's writings, if you think even about Malievich, this is a general preoccupation, is the move to figure from the abstract line. And I want to situate uh, uh, Malievich in this. Now, what I talked about last semester, last term when I talked about Malievich, was I, the extra a bit that has to be added on is, it, is that this preoccupation has to be seen as fundamental to the project of modernism. But not modernism thought of as simply, you know, and then there was modernism, as though the history of art or the history of time is simply continuous, to be thought of in terms of radical interruption. 
And the passage I've read before, which I'll read again, I think captures exactly the force of, of what Malievich is arguing. He says, and you've heard this before, but I'll say it again, and I quote, We should not resemble our fathers. Their faces, palaces, and temples may be splendid a thousand times over, but our new meaning will not inhabit them. We will build our own, our new world, and thus will not wear the forms of Greece and Rome. We should not be the peddlers of antiques, end quote. Now, I'm, I particularly love this passage from the Bulletin of the Executive Committee of the Moscow State Art Workshops uh, because what it does is dramatise the relationship between a notion of abstraction and the idea of radical interruption. In other words, it links Malievich's project of m abstraction and potentiality to that thinking of the modern which is founded on an inaugurating interruption. And to my mind, it becomes very interesting how you could understand the same image as announcing that interruption. Let me give you uh, an example. And it's an example that you won't know, so you can go away and find it. You know, when people are thinking about art, they tend to think a lot about Cezanne, and then they move on, and they discover the, the great artist, who of course is Manet. And when they discover Manet, what they discover is something <coughs> that they can't see. And that's because the characters in Manet's paintings can't see them. In other words, that the predominating way in which we understand a painting is because either light operates to provide a focal point, so you get a gradual an introduction of a line of white so that colours move towards that white. Or we get a focal point, as you have in Cezanne, through, the ge through its geometry. Or you get a focal point by the operation of an eye that holds you. You see that eye, or you see yourself being seen. There is an immediacy of relation to what you're seeing. What is interesting about Manet, and the one I have in mind is one I saw on the weekend, a painting of, of Eva Gonzalez, which is quite extraordinary. It's, it's just a woman painting. And yet you try and look at her eyes, and there's simply no way in which those eyes are looking at anything. They're not looking at you, they're not looking out, they're not looking at anything. In other words, you can't fill in that gap between you and the painting that gap that is usually immediately filled in by uh, uh, the perspective, usually filled in by a focal point, usually filled in by a lightning of colour so that we go straight here. All you ever get with Manet is a distancing. You can't get there. And no matter what you do, you can't get there. Most paintings are voluptuous. They lay themselves open to you. This doesn't. It refuses you at every moment. In other words, with Manet, what you see is an inaugurating interruption in how the notion of perspective, depth, and the picture plane is understood in the way in which the eye operates. It's done within painting, and all of a sudden, I can't get there. And now I rethink my relation to painting as a consequence. I rethink how it is I understand my body's relation to painting because I can't get to the Manet canvas. I can physically get there, but I can't get there. The eye won't allow me there. So we can begin to trace in different ways notions of interruption that mark the inception of the modern period. Now, what you find in, in, uh, in Malievich is obviously quite different to Manet, but nonetheless what's there is the idea that there will be a discontinuity that marks the advent of the new, that marks the modern period. You see it in the operative quality of Manet's paintings. You see it, as I will suggest, in Malievich, because what emerges as operative is abstraction, namely the something you have to do something with this abstract quality. So this wonderful passage about not being peddlers of antiques, not wearing the forms of Greece and Rome, opens up the general question of what will count as architecture in this period, what will count as painting. If what we have won't work, what will work? How, do one, how does one not peddle antiques? How does one not resemble one's father? And, you know, there are lots of arguments that can be brought out at this point. Now, in Malievich's own career, a concentration on these questions involved, in part, the move from painting to architecture. He gave up painting for a time in the early 20s, and the majority of his work was then centred on architectural research. It was, a research, it was research in a strict, though limited sense. 
His concern was the, his concern was the creation of architectural forms that moved away from the figure, hence the question of the image's status. Now, in regards to this move, most commentators note that within the constraints of the Russian language, at least in Malievich's argumentation, the terms figure and object are the same. And so what he's after is an architecture without figure, an architecture without object. And when I show you the images, which I will at 20 to 6, when Joel comes back and turns the lights off, um, so I have to wait that long before we see anything nice, uh, what becomes interesting is we're then, then left with how we understand the forms that he shows us. I mean, what, what interpretive framework do we take to these? So this conception of figure and object and the need to have figureless or objectless uh, art opens up a very interesting problem. And if you'd like, it's the problem of the less, objectless, figureless. What is that? Now, the, the clear analogy, which I've mentioned before, but, but it's, I mean, I think it's just obvious. The clear analogy here is with Bataille. Not the Bataille who writes the paper called Architecture, which is not really about architecture, but about the symbolic function of architecture. But the Bataille who writes the Dictionnaire Critique, the Bataille who writes the entry Informe, because in French the un is a negation, Informe. So it's not formless, it's how we understand it is the question. Now the Informe, in French we'd say the Informe qui forme, it's the formless which causes form. In other words, the Informe becomes a way of thinking about that which is prior to form, and what's prior to form is not nothing. What's prior to form is the potential for form. And that potential for form is thought by Bataille in terms of the informe. But the other affinity with, with Malievich, though I'm pushing it here, but I don't mind doing that. The other affinity with, with Malievich is clear that Bataille took the notion of the informe as critical, as a crit critique of those who believed that the question of form was already over. That the it was like form was natural, form was what there was. We know what form is, it's this thing that's related to walls and floors and dominated by the tyranny of the corner. Form is very clear, we understand what form is. Now when Bataille says the notion of the our form undoes the pretensions that we know what form is in advance, that would just be, you know, the nihilism of the 16 year old if it was simply, oh, I don't like form, form's a bad thing, as though that would do as an ar argument. The notion of the our form in Bataille becomes this generative question, and both I and others have written endlessly boring texts trying to establish this notion of the our form as productive. But it's productive not because it's a, it's a motor, it's productive because it's abstract. And if there is a link to Malievich, it resides both in the notion of abstraction as productive, firstly, but equally linking the notion of abstraction as productive to a critique of the tradition that says we know what form is. So it, it, two things work at once. So therefore, the question is, how do we understand the notion of the objectless or the formless? How do we understand the idea of the finding form? Well, the last you know, introductory m remark before I start, uh, don't worry, is, is this, is that the question of form operates in poetry, in uh, art, in uh, architecture, in whatever you want. But the question of form is usually understood as having this thing called forma finalis, a final form, that eventually will get there and will know what the form of things is. So every moment, every move to form, is part of a teleological progression thought in terms of perfectibility. It's still not right. We'll get there eventually. And you can write the history of the aeroplane on one level quite rightly as the history of the perfectibility of that form. It's just taking streamlining seriously. On one level, that's true, but in the end, there will never be, on a banal level, the final form proper to the aeroplane. And what that means is that every development, while a perfection on one level, can't be thought of teleologically in terms of an arguments for simple perfectibility. 
which is not to say there's improvement. But the notion of final form as this point you reach is abandoned. And that means that at every moment, formal considerations demand judgment on their own terms, not in terms of a posited ideal endpoint. So there are these three elements, therefore. There's abstraction, critical, uh, the notion of the interruption of, and the modern, but equally the idea of the deferral of final form. Now, all of this, I think, informs or structures, if you like, Malievich's writings and Malievich's concerns. And equally, they linked, as I'm trying to suggest, to Bataille and others who are thinking at the same historical moment about the question of the relationship between form and that which generates it. Now, this concern with form, as I'm trying to indicate, works in two directions. On the one hand, there is the creation of work, lines and forms. Equally, there is the interpretation of work, formed lines and thus form. In other words, both these things are at play. There aren't just lines, there is also their interpretation. As you, Joel, can we have the... I'll show them the pretty pictures now. So I have to stand. Oh, I can do this, can't I? Okay. Well, it's just something nicer to look at, and it's dark, so you can drift off. And uh, what becomes interesting to me, then, is, is uh, how we... I mean, my, my interest is really is how we interpret these. Now, this one and the one... Both of these, the one you just saw and this one here, have as titles something like... Uh, dwelling places for future inhabitants of the earth uh, or something, some, a version of something like this. Now what becomes interesting though I will come back to this is the relationship between the black and the white in the drawing we're interested in the interpretation of the drawing we make a lot of these lines the addition of the, uh, the writing try and clarify it if you go back to Freud's drawings it's as though you can't draw anything without writing something to clarify it. But if this is a dwelling place for future inhabitants of the earth, and if it's abstract, and if it's not representational, what is it? If we're thinking about it as, as illustrative, then we'd see it as, illus as illustrating and being the image of a future house. Namely, it would have corners, walls, black roof, it would have laws, etc., etc. It would be laid out on a grid so you could understand its location. The defining grid would give you the relationship between the elements. It would illustrate that. But to see it as illustrative means overcoming or overlooking the fact that it's potentially abstract. And it's that problem that I, I want to look at. Now, when I said the concern with lines works in two directions, what I was, ref what I was referring to was this that there's not simply this as a drawing. It's there. That's one element. The second element is how do we understand that drawing? Now, you would say to yourself, well, why would you possibly ask that second question? It's there to be understood. It just is there. The point is a more serious one. It goes back to this conceptual problem I raised at the very beginning that while it's given, while it's there, what is it that you're looking at? Do we read simply its title and name it in that way, or do we take it differently? Now, these are the two 1917 ones, and I'll come to these. Now, remember last week, I tried to give some background or syndicate some elements to Walter Benjamin's work in that paper I looked at. I want to try now genuinely to link these two projects. Benjamin's insistence on or redefining terms in relation to interiority and not to the representation within a work of that which figured externally and se is, is central. Equally what was central is the potential for understanding within that text of Benjamin's the concept of immateriality, 
that's worked with materials. The reason why we have to think of immateriality as there with the material is that if we want to hold to a concept of potentiality, if we don't want to see the line as always already a representation, if we want to see the line, as Benjamin says, is not reducible to the literal line, but it has a, a quality in addition to that, then that quality is not literally present. It's present as some sort of thing which has an immaterial force. Now, in the text I looked at uh, last week on paintings or signs and marks, this image, as I tried to argue then, emerges in relation to the graphic line. The importance of this form of line is in how it comes to acquire its identity. Remember, I tried to indicate, too, that it acquires its identity in relation to the, to the area or surface. The graphic line marks out an area, and as such, that area then becomes its background. Reciprocally, of course, a graphic line exists in relation to but equally in its differentiation from the background. Background, therefore, has a meaning for drawing because it sustains identity. While the, significantly graphic, graf, while, the, while the significance graphically of background cannot be denied, of equal importance is what Benjamin refers to in that text as the metaphysical dimension. This has to do with the conferring or securing of identity and thus there being, in addition, something more to it. It's as though what emerges is a zero condition. I'll come back to the zero. Of equal relevance in relation to the rethinking of the surface is the following comment, one I discussed last week. I quote, The identity of the background of a drawing is quite different from that of the white surface on which it is inscribed. We might even deny it that identity by thinking of it as a surge of white waves. These might not even be distinguishable to the naked eye. And then I want to make a lot of this idea of the, of the background being a surge of white waves, of there being something there in addition to what is given to the eye. This, uh, this, this notion of something being given to the eye and there being more than given to the eye works to force us to reconsider again and again the nature of the image. If the image is always more, than what is given to the eye, what's the status of the image? Let me give you another very clear example. Let's say that we are Darwinians. Let's say that we believe, because we are, let's say that we believe in a notion of adaptability. Let's believe that we have a notion of a milieu as adaptable. Anything within it adapts to it. The milieu itself adapts to the introduction of something new. In other words, that this notion of a milieu Within, within a Darwinian framework, it has a machinic or mechanistic quality. It has an operative quality. If I take a photograph of it, I don't capture the machine at work. If I describe it at a given moment, I don't describe its machinic quality, I just give you a static image. In other words, if the quality of things is always to do with potentiality, to do with the, the, op the operative, to do with what Zola, a French 19th century novelist, called the mechanism of facts, or to do with the machinic in general, then what you see and is, is always, what, what is there rather, is always more than what is seen. You can never see the potentiality, you can never see the machine at work. Now, if we see these as beyond the illustrative and we see them as generative, we have to see them as more than simply an arrangement of spaces that are coloured on a sheet. Now the question is, can we do that? And um, the, here the debate emerges. When these were used in the AA 15, longer, 20 years ago, these exact images, what students were encouraged to do was to extrude these. And these were read as a critique of the grid and the grid was critiqued through, though there's no such verb as to critique, but I'll use it, was critiqued through a collage technique. So these become a critical engagement with the grid because they operate on the level of collage, but equally the grid is, is disrupted here and here. You can't reduce it back to the originating grid. So you, you undo the grid condition. But that's a, the assumption is that you read this then literally, as a literal refusal of the grid. Now, that's perfectly plausible, precisely because images always have the potentiality to be read in more than one way. It's 
possible to read that as a collage-based critique of the grid. The very fact that you have these organizing lines here, 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 which organize the spatial situation outside of a grid structure, which distribute the elements outside of a grid structure, means that it is possible to read this as a collage-based critique of the grid and therefore a collage-based critique of grid-based urbanism. And it's not difficult to see why Colin Rowe is fascinated by this and can see within this enormous potentiality. But reading it in that way holds to it as being a literal image. Doesn't see it as having potentiality except by extruding it, by pulling each of those blocks up. Now what we have to think about is the possibility that were we to see this in, as what Benjamin would call you know, pure drawing, if we were to see this as pure drawing, then what we would have to locate within it is its potentiality. And therefore the architectural question would be, if that's the case, how does one release the potential in that? If that's the case, how does one release the potential in it? Now, what this means, what this gestures to, is the fact that the drawn line, running with this argument, it follows that the drawn line does not have an, an automatically determinable status. The relationship between lines drawn on a page does not have an automatically identifiable identity, which is not to say, of course, that lines don't have a history. Now, for, while for Benjamin, this is understood through what he referred to as naming. For Malievich, something else comes into play. What he wants to do is argue the following, that these drawings are abstract, no problem, and the way in which abstraction is to be understood is as excitement, his word. And the passage I read before, which I'll, I'll read again, is this. I quote, excitement like molten copper in a blast furnace seethes in a state that is purely objectless. That is, it seethes in a state that is without figure. It seethes in a state that is abstract. But notice his language. Excitement like molten copper seethes in a state that is purely objectless. He goes on. Excitement. Combustion is the supreme white force that sets thought in motion. Excitement is like the flame of a volcano that flickers within a human being without the goal of meaning. A human being is like a volcano of excitements, whereas thought is concerned with perfections. And again, to me, this is, is fundamental. And in this passage from Malievich, you see both the reference to Bataille, which I'll come back to, but equally this idea of abstraction understood as potentiality. When he says, that excitement sees in a state that is purely objectless. The Russian word objectless is the same as our word, or the same as the word figureless, which we could easily translate into abstraction. So what we get is abstraction is potentiality. Potentiality is only ever abstract. Now, therefore, the project is the release of that potentiality. But to find two other points, and one could spend hours and hours on this passage, but I won't, is one, the idea is that it, potentiality exists, and I quote him, without the goal of meaning, firstly. And secondly, that, that excitement is counterposed to what he calls thought. Now, let me just run the second one through. In this little text of Bataille's that I referred to, which you all ought to read, it's only... 12 lines long, just write it out, stick it on the wall, it's done, called informe, or in English, formless. Bataille has this marvelous moment in it where he says, don't forget the informe is a, a critique of the idea that form is, an, is assumed. He says, and I quote him, that academic men like form, and God forbid we should have said academic men, so the point is that, that the academy, philosophy, believes it knows the answer to the question of form, knows what form is. To counterpose this is not to develop a critique of, of, uh, of that, but to see that what's counterposed to it. So when uh, Malievich says, excitement 
is counterposed to perfection, Bataille would say that the informe is counterposed to the belief in we already know what the question of form is. So philosophy who, that thinks it has an answer to the question of form is distanced by uh, Malievich in the name of excitement. For Bataille, academic men, philosophy, is distanced in the name of a productive negativity, the informe. So there's a real resonance then between Malievich and Bataille in terms of how we'd understand the production of form and the inherent criticality brought in to this project. I mean, it's, I mean, it's worthwhile you know, pausing, if only for a moment. I mean, one of the great problems that's emerged with uh, architecture in the age of its digital reproducibility is that we tend to lose sight of the nature of criticality, of what the critical would be. You know, in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s, we thought we knew the answer. It was being progressive, or it was, you know, doing this sort of architecture opposed to that sort of architecture. What you get from Malievich and Bataille is something quite different. And there's nothing wrong with these other projects, I assure you. That what the notion of the critical emerges with the disruption of, a, the, con of the continuity of a certain possibility of thought. Namely, to hold to abstraction as generative is to refuse a notion of form as already given and as perfect. As perfect. To hold to the idea of the form as generative is to refuse these things as well. So to champion the notion of excitement and potentiality, equally in Bataille's sense, to champion the notion of the form is already to think with the abeyance of that dominating tradition. In other words, that the critical lies not in terms of utility or not in terms of uh, there, there, being, there having to be an end to something, but in the actual mode of thinking itself. In that refusal of certain modes of thinking is the allowing of other modes of thinking to emerge. So there is therefore something very interesting going on on this, this championing of, the, of excitement as potentiality. The final part, and as I said, we could spend hours on this passage. The final part is, he says, that excitement is like the flame of a volcano that flickers within a human being without the goal of meaning. Let's just stick with the English for a second. The word goal means without there being a final point. In other words, that without the teleology driven by the necessity for something to mean. More than that as I was discussing with some people earlier this afternoon, what is interesting in the deferring of meaning is, and, and I always make this point, but I think it's a point that needs to be made continually, this is where we bring back the materialist tectonic tradition of architecture. It's Gottfried Zemper who argues more or less the same, namely that art worthy of the name is not interested in meaning, it's interested in the operation of materials. The operation of materials may have a meaning, how could they not, but what we're interesting is, interested in is the operative quality of the object. The result of the operative quality is its meaning. So when, but when uh, Malievich says potentiality does not have an end in itself, especially not the end of meaning. Therefore, not only is that interesting, as I said, in and of itself, it's fascinating because it defines a particular site of research and project, namely the releasing of potential becomes the project of architectural research. We can evaluate it, we can begin to draw judgments, we can be critical of it, but the project of research is, to use this rather flowery language, the release of potential. And the release of potential becomes the finding of form. And, and the finding of form is then what we begin to investigate. Now, both uh, Malievich and Lazitsky developed these things in the 20s they called prown. And crowns were, if you like, three-dimensional manifestations of suprematist drawings. They were white objects. And they were posed real questions in terms of how they were to be understood. Now, in order to, to, to approach this, what I want to do just very quickly is talk about nothing but not just the nothing that we usually talk about, but nothing as zero. Both Lazitsky and Malievich talked about the zero degree of painting. And again, if that seems difficult to grasp, it's very straightforward. 
where do I begin? With what do I begin? Well, you begin at the beginning. Yes, but if I don't want to imitate my father, resembles my father, be peddlers of antiques, what do I begin with? How does one begin? And Lzitsky, writing about this, says, For us, however, the zero was the... T uh, sorry, for Lzitsky, Malievich wanted to reduce all forms, all paintings, to zero. Lzitsky counted in the following way. He said, For us, however, this zero was the turning point. We have a series of numbers coming from infinity. It, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. It comes right down to the zero, then begins with the ascending line. Zero, one, two, three, four, five. These lines are ascending to the other side of the picture. Now, what, what Lisitsky was trying to do is to say, look, through any zero automatically runs a line. From any zero there runs another line. Now, that sounds slightly mystical. What could it possibly mean? It means this. Is that, that every starting point, every zero, already brings the infinite number of num numbers and possibilities prior to that zero into contention. A very clear example of this, and it's, it's, if you like, it's something to do with repetition. I build a house, I create a painting, I write a symphony, and I would say, no one has ever done this before, this is the point zero. To which the answer is, no, it's not. It exists in relation to the infinite number of other things that were done in its name before that. So through that zero runs everything else. From that zero, something else begins. Now what's interesting, Lizitsky was very used the notion of zero to contextualize his work. So allowing for the zero to be positioned on either side of a progression gives the work a context and a point of intersection. The zero therefore has a, has a locational quality. Now the conception of zero in Malievich is importantly different. The contrast between Lozitsky and Malievich can be located at the zero. And yet the contrast with the point defined as an intersection is not to posit, it, posit the point as pure simplicity. To do so would, would be to define the zero as an axiom, it would be to give the zero a Cartesian quality. The zero for Lozitsky is a zero of location. The zero for Malievich is a zero of action a zero of possibility. In other words, if we see these as abstract, we have to see these as point zero. But the only thing that matters in seeing them as point zero, the only point, as it were, is what happens at one. And zero never matters. What matters is the one. However, this is zero. So the project means getting from zero to one. Now, one way of getting from zero to one would be to read these as a collage-based critique of the grid. But if we don't do that, what quality zero does this have such that one is disjunctively, graphically, intellectually, with this a zero? Now, while this may seem, as I said, seem very strange, it's a very straightforward argument. If any image is zero, what is one? I mean, what is the move after zero? And what Malievich is, is interested in is maintaining the idea of the purely objectless, of, of excitement, and thus the zero, but not to define it as a spatial condition, but to define it as that which is generative. So for him, the zero, the move from zero to one, is not move from one spatial dimension from another, it's the actualization of potential. It's the realization of the abstract. It's not the becoming less abstract by refining it. It's not by turning this into an abstract machine. It's to see this is abstraction. And therefore, the, the research question in architecture, not in art, but in architecture, is to ask the question of the one. What is, it, what is the move from zero to one? How does one understand that move given that it has to be of necessity disjunctive, not conjunctive. Now, it could be that we then not want to go anywhere with this, but there may be something, something here. Now, oh, and obviously, you know, again, historically, you know this, but I'll uh, say it anyway. I mean, for, this, for Colin Rowe, these things are fundamental. For Van Dersburg, these things are fundamental. For Mies, 
and for Korb, especially in Rowe's reading of it, these images are, are absolutely foundational within a certain understanding of modernist architecture. And that, well, one needs to sort of concede that point and then move on. So, the, so let me move on. The question of what is seen only emerges with real force once it is recognized that at play for Malievich, as I've said, is the zero. But what is the zero? I quote, it is the ring of transfiguration of all that is with object into the objectless, end quote. Two questions arise here. The first is how transformation is to be understood. I mean, again, I'll give you the quote. What is, he, what is the zero? Is the ring of transfiguration of all that which is with object into the objectless. Now, that's very interesting. If this is with object, let me just go here. Make it even tougher for ourselves. You know. If this is with object, and to use Malievich's language, then it's a representation of boxes with black roofs and houses. Okay. To see this as zero is to see it as objectless. In other words, to, to put into brackets that seeing that would see it as object. I mean, to use more conventional language, that seeing that would see it as figures. To see it as objectless is to see it as ground zero. And it's only it's a seeing it as objectless that it then has the capacity to be zero. And at that point, and only at that point, does it become possible to ask the question of the one. Again, what becomes is, is significant is the possibility of the transformation of this into the zero condition. And straightforwardly, that involves not seeing it representationally. And in not seeing it representationally, it can have a quality that's generative and only that way. I mean, one of the uh, great you know, projects that you can work on is uh, doing this with canonical drawings in the history of architecture. In other words, is to refuse their historical specificity, refuse their actual particularity, and begin to work with them as zero. Namely, to transform them from re historical representations into the possibility of uh, that which might generate form. I mean, another obvious way to do this would be to play with Pyrenees' The Prisons, to see these as zero is not to see them as the impossibility of representation. Where do those bridges really go? Isn't that interesting? But to say, given these diagrams, because they're now zero, they're now diagrams, given these diagrams, what would it be like to see them at condition one? Namely, what's the architectural thinking that turns these not into the failure of representation, the failure of architectural drawing, but that moment of architectural drawing, which, to use Malievich's language, is objectless, and in being objectless allows for the move from zero to one as that movement, movement which is the release of potentiality. Now, uh, so the zero has, therefore, for us, a really a different exigency then there is a zero that is not thought of as a, a, a place that you move to and move out of. Lizitsky thought, and I think, I mean, Lizitsky is a very interesting thinker, but his thinking of zero is always allowing him to contextualize the moment. So it's a zero that's always spatially driven. What matters for us is to begin to think about a conception of zero which is not spatial at all, but will discover its spatiality, as it were, that is, that is linked to action rather than location. And as such, as I've been trying to indicate, the move to one becomes the defining element. Now, what I've tried to do, and I have a little more to say, is that uh, what I've tried to do is try was indicate that if one of the problems that we have is the status of the image, we can, if we're writing a history of architecture in the 20s, we can show these and we can say, well, this was the projected house for people in the future. This is the way Malievich understood it. He had a lot of writing here which clarified it. He did sections, sort of axonometrics, uh, and you can see it all, and that's what it illustrates. 
And there's absolutely no problem with that. It's a perfectly reputable thing to say, and it's done by architectural historians, and that's fine. Well, what we're interested in is not that. That's the move that gives it an op its being as object. What we're interested in is, and I have to emphasize this, is the possibility, and it's a possibility, the possibility of its being objectless, namely the possibility of its having a zero condition. And indeed, the way of, 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 of engaging this with a question, we'd need a, a studio that went for a semester to work this out, is say, is it possible to take this as a zero condition? Is it possible to see this as a diagram and not as representation? And that would be, the, that's how we test, and this would be architectural research, that's how we test the viability of this. We would accept Malievich's description of the diagram which is the, the, the transformation to zero. And then we'd say, all right, if this is useful for us in thinking about the creation of form, if it is, if this image is, then we'd work on it in such a way that the move from zero to one would be the object of the studio. In the same way, if we're interested in the Piranesi, what we'd do is, we, and this is one of the great Eisenman studios, is that what we do is we take those drawings of the bridges moving through space, never meeting, not seeing them as failure, not seeing them as sort of ironic or anything like that, but as seeing them as zero, to reduce them to the zero by eliminating the language and thinking of representation to ask then, is it possible that they could be viewed as generative? And that becomes a very different thing to do generationally you know, and I say this as an old person, a different thing to do generationally than what's usually done you know, with images of this nature. What's usually done with images of this nature is, as I've said, they're, they're seen as collage, they're seen as disruptive of the grid, they're seen as real, another way of reorganizing urban space, etc., etc. But it assumes the, the not thinking in terms of the zero. It assumes the not seeing this diagrammatically but seeing it as always already a spatial relation. Now again, to test the viability of this as a project, and I'm not sure I know what the answer is, I'm not that wise. But what I do know is that we now are in a different position to manipulate these images, to deal with these images in different ways, because we have different relationships to the means of representation. And those that different relationship to the means of representation allows us to rethink and reconfigure the way in which we operate with these images. And as I said, if we had the time and we don't, what we'd do is we'd now spend the next four or five weeks working out what's it like to take this as a condition zero, as an architectural project, and not to see these images as illustrative, but to see them as generative. Now, I think, you know, just to, to, to push this a stage further, oh. I think it becomes harder and harder, as you know, Malievich draws, to maintain this position, to maintain this interruptive, disjunctive quality that has to be there. Now, one of the ways I try and, try and write this is I write the words, yet to be, because I quite like writing that, and I put little dashes, like yet dash to dash be dash. And what I want to say is that what, what marks out the diagram is, a, is as it were, a yet-to-be quality. And therefore, to see this as zero is to see it as yet-to-be what it is. And therefore, the questions I'm saying is, how do we understand or release the yet-to-be quality? But once we get the detail of something like this, and you can already see now that you've got gradations of colour. I mean, it, it's worth being super attentive to the drawing and not just being glib about it. Once, I am not tall enough to do this. But once you've got the dark, the block of dark that here, you have a finer gray here. So you've already got differentiations in the drawing and then the most appalling moment, the moment where the anti-humanist you wants to get out and beat someone to death, you have people being drawn in. You know, so you've now, he's now made the classic mistake. He's introduced scale. So we now know how to look at this thing because of these dreadful little entities up here. I mean, so it, as I said, with certain Malievich drawings, to be fair, it becomes tougher and tougher 
to see the yet-to-be quality. Because once you've introduced scale as external to the system by introducing what you know the thing that architecture just can't let go of, or it, it, as much as it ought to, and that is the organisation of the whole of the human body. I mean, here, these three little guys up there give us the scale and therefore define all of this in relation to that. If they weren't there, we would have no idea. And hence, it would be, on a very straight, literal level, abstract. As soon as they're introduced, we know that this must be two and a half metres, uh, because it then works with those bodies. So already, it becomes... So, you, so my argument is, when you have a drawing of this nature, because of these gradations of colour, and because of the human body giving you scale, it becomes harder and harder to see in what sense this can be read as abstract. This can be read as zero. Now, it's not just that you eliminate the bodies, it becomes easier. But we have to ask what the bodies stand for, those three little bodies. You can't see them, can you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Two, three little guys. What becomes, once you have this, then, then each of these elements are not defined relationally in one regard to each other, they're defined externally to the, of the system. And therefore, the ordering principle is the size of the human body. To, 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 you know, so with, with working with Malievich, one has to go from one set of images to another. But the question we ask is the question of, can I see this at zero? The last one, which I don't have an image of, but nonetheless I do think is extremely interesting, are, are the development of what he called his uh, architectons. And the architectons were large white objects that were three-dimensional, that were rectangle, re rectangles, were obvious, obviously buildings, but they were all white. And he believed that these were suprematist architecture, and he believed that they occurred at the state zero. And I think what then that opens up something very interesting for architecture, and which I can't go into. And that, that is, what is architecture's relationship to the model? I mean, we all, like last week at the DRL jury, there were models. Every time there'll be models. But the relationship architecture has to the history of the model must parallel, on a level of questioning, architecture has to the image, because both of these are bound up with architecture's capacity to represent itself as architecture. So Malievich's models are, are large, white, undifferentiated objects that look like buildings, or that look like the outline of buildings, or look like buildings painted white. You can run it as many ways as you, you want. You cannot escape that there is an image in some sense of building. Now, therefore, our, the project, which again we'd want to spend time testing, is can these be seen as zero? And it's very clear that precisely what, what Malievich does in moving away from uh, the addition of colour and the addition of human body and therefore scale is to try and give you an almost literal sense of abstraction. And that was by, the, by eliminating the possibility of, poly, of, poly, of polychromatic, eliminating anything outside of the system and allowing for these things to operate as zero because that's all you could see. Now, whether they're successful or not doesn't matter. What we're left with, and here I'll bring this to an end now, what, they're, what we're left with, we're interested in the generative line. What we're left with, with Malievich, is, 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 a, is a research project. That we have to set up the possibility of an investigation. The virtue of investigating Malievich's lines, and the, these drawn lines here, is that his work, interestingly, in my view at least, provides a framework within which we can evaluate the very project itself. In other words, the, it, the framework is, let's see these as zero conditions. Not the zero of counting, not the zero of location, but, the, but the, uh, the zero in which the move to one is disjunctive on the level of the image. Namely, that the zero is the, the necessity, and it's a necessity, the necessity to see these as objectless 
therefore as non-representational, as standing for nothing other than themselves, for being visually what they are, and that's it. Now, he gives us that as a project. Now, whether it's successful is up to a you know, seminar, semester's length studio to investigate. That's more than we can do tonight, hopefully, happily. But what matters is the work gives us the mode of evaluation. And what this does, on the one hand, it brings in those other thinkers like Bataille who are fundamental to understand this aspect of the modernist project, this aspect that's fundamentally tied up with a productive logic, a productive logic that's not driven by meaning or goals, but whose very criticality lies in its having a productive machine quality on the one hand. Equally, it allows us to draw in other philosophers like Deleuze who may be of interest uh, in how we theorize this. But what matters to me at least is that Malievich's own understanding of these images provides in advance the ground of exploration. And we're left now with what's flickering on the screen. And the question one could take to what's flickering on the screen like, is this, is there really nothing there? Thank you. And, and we, we do it again tomorrow, but on a different... I want to move to the discussion of the diagram in more detail tomorrow. Are they supposed to? I mean, well, that's sorry. That's the question. I mean, he didn't ever do buildings, and there's no reason to believe th these. These. This one has an architectural title. This one doesn't. This one's called Suprematist Drawing. Uh, whatever date it is, and this has. Uh, I'm not going to find it now, but it has an architectural uh, like drawing for future houses or something like this. Now, whether he actually th thought there were going to be houses based on this is a question to which I don't know the answer. Well, y yes and no. I mean, as always, because it's a good question. The, 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 what I'm trying to argue is that obviously in regard to to this one, it's very easy to see these as drawings of buildings. It's not a problem. However, he calls this a supremacist drawing. Okay. Now, if he's consistent, and that's all, I mean, sometimes that's all my point is, if he's, if, he's, if he's consistent in the argument, then this has to be seen as objectless. Now, if it's seen as objectless, it can't be seen as representational. Therefore, what do we see when we look at it? Now, it's a tougher question with that one because it so obviously looks like buildings. But as we go back, and especially to this one, which does have an architectural title, because this looks even further removed from the possibility of viewing it representationally, therefore viewing it as with object, it's easier to see as objectless, first point. Now, this is where your point comes in. However, again, to be consistent with Malievich, were we to see it as objectless, then what's the object that occurs afterwards? Because to see it as already a building, or already this plan for a building, or something like this, is to see it as object, and therefore not to see it as zero, but to see it as already one. But he wants us to see it as zero. Now, what I'm trying to say is that that, as a problem within design, is a problem that is bequeathed to us because of the nature of digital images. But what's interesting when you go back to the history of drawing, you can begin to see retrospectively that that sort of problem is exercising someone like Malievich. Namely that if the move from this, if this is zero, if it's zero, the move from zero to one, if that move is to take place, then it has to be disjunctive on the level of the image. And if that's true, how do you get from zero to one? Now that, to my mind, reiterates the problem of the diagram in contemporary architecture. 
And that, that's the point I want to make. But sure, I agree with you, absolutely, there's a distinction between drawing and, 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 and painting. Equally, there's a distinction between drawing and building. However, we usually understand the relationship between drawing and building in terms of a structure of representation, and that, well, that's what his argument is precluding. That's the point. Yeah, that's it right. It seems like, you know, your talk, of course, is kept very close to the rhetoric of these painters, these yeah. artists, these mm. architects. Mm. Um, but in the end, has it really given us any more yield? Oh, I... The reiterations of the rhetoric, where the oh, no. well, you know, my latest would say, see it, as, <coughs> see it as degree zero in each case. But, mm. you know, and the honest viewer can't but say, but the one is a drawing from which you can make a building, mm. and the other is not a drawing from which you can make a building. Okay, but, but, but no, no, sure, sure. Well, whatever you may say about it. No, no, well, I'm well, sort of yes and no. I mean, I, I, I do take the point that, that, that you're making, but I, I, I just think it's, if the world were that easy, you know, be no, it be, would be over. I mean, I do think that what, 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 is, what is, you can begin to take both of these as giving you, as I've said before, aspects of relationality, a whole series of different things. Now, one of the, the interesting problems in the history of architecture has always been the relationship between a drawing and, and a building, and how we move from one to the other. Now, one of the projects of, of, of the, more, the, the more, more creative end of architecture has been to try and draw other possibilities or make models of other possibilities. Here I'm thinking of someone like Kiesler, for example. You know, and, and then the question is, how does this work as an architectural image? Now, you're right, I'm sticking very closely to what, uh, Mal to what Malievich is saying, not because, you know, it's just, it's fun to say, oh, it's not a representation, isn't that interesting, because it looks like one, but to say that actually, as I said before in my first, first time I responded to you, was that actually what this does is repeat the problem of design as it's occurring at the moment. In other words, one of the problem of design is that with the way in which software operates, the way in which a certain urban analysis or datascape can be created, is that there's a great temptation, as it were, to build your analysis, as the saying goes. In other words, you take what's on the screen because it has the, the look of the volumetric, you take it volumetrically. But if you didn't take it volumetrically, you then have to say, well, what's the volume proper to it? Namely, you'd see it as a disjunctive relation between the, the computer animation and a possible building. That, that's, that's a standard, and my belief, belief, my experience at least, a standard problem of architectural pedagogy at the moment because of the nature of digital design. Just the, one of the, you know, like Monday morning problems. It's not a big deal, it's not a little deal, it just is. And what becomes interesting to me is to, is to not just is say, all right, that's within the pedagogy of design, that's an issue. And it's an issue every day of the week. At every jury, it's an issue. Every midterm credit, it's an issue. So, however, 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 what's interesting is that a version of that was an issue for Malievich as well. And that therefore we can learn something from looking at the way, and, and in the end, we may want to distance ourselves from it. But his insistence that what looks volumetric is not, because that's a re reiteration of a similar problem of design today. And on one level, I don't like saying that's all I'm saying, but on one level, the point I'm trying to make is that, namely that, 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 that every time there's an innovation on the level of technical reproduction, and therefore the pedagogical problems that then flow from it, once that occurs, it allows us to recast the history of drawing or the history of whatever, to notice interesting affinities. And what I tried to say about Benjamin last week and Freud last week and now this tonight is to show that it is interesting that this problem, you know, we can now see as bedeviling a number of moments within the history of thought. So that's, that's, that's more to contextualize it more. But, you know, it's not a question of being right or wrong. It's just simply saying that what's interesting is, is that. Are there other are there, are there more other questions? I'd like to ask you yeah. just a quick question about your, your term, uh, the yet to be. Yes. Um, I, was, I was wondering if you saw the kind of, if you regard these as a kind of degree zero, in mm. that they have a potential that mm. it's our, might be our job to actualize. Mm. Um, is that 
attention, attention and the kind of yet to be quality mm. imminent in these images that, mm. that we have to unlock or is it not a question of us working to agree upon a solution whereby my language might become mm. inspirational in some mm. way or well, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure what you would... Well, I, yeah. I mean, are the kind of solutions that we could use imminent mm. in the... Yeah, no, no, I, 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 in part I wanted you to say the word imminent again. Now I have the answer. The answer is yes. Right. Okay, because the notion of... like the, One of the great standard ways in the history of philosophy to talk about potentiality, but to also make it problematic, was Aristotle's discussion about whether or not the, the statue of the... Greek god was imminent in the marble and was in some sense released by the, the sculptor. Now that's in some sense, that is, that is a version of potentiality and of imminence. It's not quite that, but there is nonetheless that notion that, in, that what you're not seeing, what's not under the eye, in that literal sense of on the, in your, there to be seen, is potentiality. Now, it's also, because I, I want the way in which I set it up, I, I've set it up to both succeed and to fail. I've said that it may be the case that at the end of our studio on Malievich, you know, when the students presented the work, they said, look, in the end, this stuff just is not productive or interesting. There's very little we can do with it. I, I doubt that. But I would, I'm prepared for that to be the case. But in the case of the Piranesi, I, I saw that work spectacularly well, where you took the, um, the, 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 you know, the interiors of the prisons and the, the bridges that don't meet, etc., etc. You took those not as you know, almost avant la lettre, postmodern failures of, of connectivity or something, but actually said, no, no, there's zero conditions. Now, what's it like to use those diagrammatically for architecture? And, and in other words, what, what gets to be emerge in the end has its origin in a discussion about the Piranesi drawings, but in the end has, as it were, nothing on the level of the image, you know, nothing on the level of the image to do with them, but everything to do with what was imminent within them. So what I would say is that if we took these and we, we really worked on them as that which had potential, in the end, you know, ten weeks down the line, we'd see a series of images or models or whatever the students would say, I took Malievich and I did blah, blah, but what you'd see would have no relation to it on the level of the image. And so the answer is it, it is to do with things like potentiality and imminence. Uh, yeah. Jeff, as soon as you say buildings would follow from it, and I think you're back to the Colin Rowe interpretation of these paintings, as soon as you say after a period of how we've studied this image, students might come to an idea, I've got a model for a building here, mm -hmm. then inevitably that model for a building would be interpretable in terms of its relation to this image. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, look, I, I, do, I really do take the polemical force of what you're saying, and, 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 and I'm very, I mean, I'm, you can actually see into, into what I'm doing. I mean, the subtext of all of this is obviously a critique of Colin Rowe. You no, know, well, it's not very much of a subtext. Okay, well, then, okay, well, okay, for you, there's not. <laughs> no, no, sorry, sorry. I mean, other people don't notice this. You do, that's cool. I, no problem with that. Yeah, okay, what I'm trying to do is actually to, I mean, the whole project is really to say that. Colin Rowe, and then and after him, Eisenman's relationship to you know Vitkova's redrawing of Palladio, which gives you Mies and Cole, blah 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 blah. That doesn't give you. And I'm not sure. I don't think Colin, right, Colin Rowe is right about Mies and Cole, but let's assume he is. That doesn't give you then the basis of on the level merely of of the reorganisation of the plan, of the possibility of abandoning Palladianism, for example. So you can read this in a Colin Rowe way, which says, look, this, this is you know, the attempt to abandon Palladio, this is the overcoming of the nine squares, blah, 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 blah. And, and I'm saying that that only works, if it works, on the basis of the history of architecture is the history of the plan. And Colin Rowe is bound up with that. And I wanted to say that the history of architecture, of the many things it is, one of the least productive ways of viewing it, especially when one wants to think of those interruptive moments, is in terms of disruptions merely on the level of the plan. 
because all you ever get is planimetric reorganization, whether it's reorganizations to move the plant, reorganize on the facade, or whatever it is. What's going on here uh, is to say that that these are not reorganizations of the plan, it's another way of conceiving of the image. So in a sense it would be to take the whole Colin Rowe argument and put it to one side and say we, we're not interested in a... Say it's not architecture, it's painting. Well no, but then, then the question is, is there within these the potential for architecture? Well, yes, but, but the plan may be on the level of the image disjunctively related to the diagram that created it. And that's, that's the point. So it's not reducing it to a painting. Though I do take the point you're making. I, mean, I do see this as the, as the problem. Yeah. Um, if, just going back down to the notion of zero, um, and, and you also suggested that it wasn't necessarily a cartesian point, mm. but considering um, in terms of the threshold, mm. Well, yes. I mean, I mean, again, I, I would be quite happy with a, with a. The trouble is, it's going to create the same problem. But I would be quite happy with a formulation such as a threshold condition, because then what become what what matters is what happens in the passing of that. And and the, 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 instead of assuming that you know these little white things here are marks already there within it, if you talk those in a different sort of way, then what becomes interesting is to understand the blurring of all of those interconnections rather than them being already given connections drawn in with all the connectivity established. And so on that level, it would be. Because this establishes the relationship between... I mean, it, probably, it doesn't establish anything, but one way of reading it is, by esta is, is already establishing, you know, because of the black versus the white, you've got discrete elements. But what it doesn't do is say, well, can you have discreteness while the threshold condition's being blurred? In other words, can you understand connectivity in which there are discrete elements without there having to be a door? In other words, can you see the logic of egress and entrance, the logic of fenestration, as integral to the logic that generates the wall rather than as disjunctive with it the way this has. So you could begin to analyse this as setting up differing possibilities. And I suppose that's again the point I'm making. It's setting up differing possibilities, all of which have differing architectural resolutions. But if you took that as simply that which has to be extruded, then it only has one possible architectural resolution, rather than at least two or three possible architectural resolutions. So yes, yeah, so a threshold would be a way of overcoming the fact that, that we usually understand fenestration as, as an interruption of the logic that creates the wall by punching a hole in it. And I mean, if you take ARM's museum in, in Canberra, what's so lovely about that is that the, 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 the door is just a flip within the, within the spinal, uh, spinal, spinal logic, spinal geometry, spline-based geometry that gives you the wall also gives you the door. So there's not an interruptive potential, and yet you can still have a door. And so that, that you still have discreteness, but a different logical organization. And what we do is we begin to push at that interconnection there to see what potential lay in it. And as I said, it may be none, it may be a lot. OK? Thank you very much. Oh, right.
I, 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 I know sorry, I know the name. I just can't give you a top of my head answer. I just can't. Yeah, yeah, I just, I just don't know. What's the, what's the name? I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't have a. I'm sorry. I'll think about it. If you're here, the next couple of days, I'll take you.